Hello, good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so today we're looking at Ryle's article, Descartes Smith, and the topic um, that I want to get to in the end is analytical behaviorism. Um, to say what behaviorism is, it's a quite different take on the, on the mind to Descartes. Um, but we'll get there uh, by a slow and leisurely route. Um, on Tuesday, we look at um, Putnam's article, Brains and Behavior, that's in the Chalmers Reader. As you'll see, that's again a short article. It's only nine pages. But again, most of these articles need to be read many times to get what's going on. OK. Um, on Tuesday, also, we'll give out the topics for the first essay. Um, the first essay is due on October the 3rd. Uh, so that's what, about four weeks, something like that, uh, from now. Um, and uh, the second essay will be due the uh, Tuesday, November the 12th. And then the other piece of evaluation will be the exam on December the 17th. Um, OK, any questions about that? OK. Um, let me just check, for how many of you is philosophy, uh, this your first philosophy class? Wow, practically everybody. Um, OK, writing a philosophy essay is not quite like writing an essay in any other subject. So it would be good to start thinking about the essay in a general kind of way as soon as you can. And we'll t I'll talk a little bit about what you should be doing in the essay on Tuesday. And you'll, you'll have many opportunities to discuss this further in between now and October. OK, um, I'll, what we're really concerned with in this class is the mind-body problem, the question what the mind is. But a lot of the times, we have to look at a slightly different topic, namely how you know about the mind. Because how you, it seems like we know about our minds and we know about other people's minds in a way that's quite unlike the way that we know about physical objects. There is something weird about the way we know about our minds. And uh, uh, that seems to have implications for what kind of thing the mind can be. Maybe the simplest argument along these lines is Descartes' argument that you're more certain about your knowledge of the mind's existence than you are about the knowledge of any physical thing. But as we'll see, there are lots of peculiarities about your knowledge of your own mind. And this is something that in a way is familiar to everybody, but it's certain, just a matter of spelling out and trying to get right what those weirdnesses are about the way we have knowledge of our own minds. Um, OK, I want to start out with um, this remark from, uh, where is it, the temple at Delphi? Know thyself. Um, is such a powerful remark, know thyself. I, I think not much is known about why that was written in the first place or what exactly was meant by it. But it really seems important, know thyself. And the thing about self-knowledge is it seems to be valuable. Um, you must have known people who, people go through some great disaster. They go through some very hard time. And then at the end of it, Someone says sympathetically, but of course you understand yourself better as a result of all that. Um, I was just listening to a lecture on King Lear, um, where uh, the king is um, the king loses all his possessions. He loses his kingship. He loses his family. He spends the night naked in a storm. He goes mad for a while, um, and at the end of it, people say sympathetically, "Well, but now you know your own mind." And you think, well, whatever exactly that is, knowing your own mind, it must be pretty good if it's worth going through all that to get to. I mean, we do, I think, actually think it's pretty valuable. But it's puzzling why it should be valuable. I mean, what is so important about that? I mean, nobody says knowledge of automobiles is very, very important. I mean, unless, of course, you're a mechanic or something. But not everybody thinks, well, knowing yourself, that really that's really key. You know, that's what life's all about, is it? It's pretty important. But why should that be? What, what is it about the self that makes knowledge of it so important? And one connected question here is, is it easy to know yourself 
or is it hard? And actually, can we just take a vote on this? I'd quite like to know what your first impulse is. Is no, knowing your own mind easy? Yes? Put up your hand if it's easy. Is knowing your own mind hard? Okay, that's a, a, about a two to one split in favour of hard. So, uh, something like that. Um, I think what Descartes thinks is pretty easy. Um, I mean, the mind is, I, I, I don't know how to put this, the self is like a vanishing point at the centre of all these sensations and feelings and so on. And um, everything that's inside the circle is kind of easy to know, right? It might all be a dream, it might all be hallucinations, but you've got your perspective and things, and you know what's going on in here. Once you step outside the mind to knowledge of the physical world, well, that's a bit harder. Now, that's Descartes' picture, and that fits very well with you guys that say um, it's easy to know your own mind. But it is difficult to see why in that picture knowing your own mind should be valuable. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, in a way, if it's so easy, how could it be worth anything? Um, here's a quote from Charles Taylor. Consider someone who's been ashamed of his background. Let's suppose it's you. Let's suppose that you're ashamed of your back. You have been ashamed of your background. At the time, this is not at all clear to you. You feel unease, a lack of confidence, a vague sense of unworthiness. Then you're brought to reflect in this. You come to feel that being ashamed of what you are, apologizing for your existence, is senseless. On the contrary, there's something demeaning about feeling that kind of shame, something degrading, something supine, something craven about it. You start to feel ashamed that you were ashamed. You start to rejoice in your background. You start to say, what the hell? I'm from Glasgow. There you are. <laughs> Take it. <laughs> right? um, most of us, if, you're not, if you haven't had that sensation yourself, most people are familiar with that. And the thing is that that knowledge of your own um, shame in your background, that can be something that's really hard won. That's something difficult to get to. You don't just look inside yourself and say, yeah, I'm pretty proud of my background or I'm pretty ashamed of my background and that's easy. That can be difficult. All that goes on is that you notice, I feel unease in some social situations. I feel a certain lack of confidence. I feel a vague sense of unworthiness. You would never admit to yourself that I'm embarrassed about my background. Um, or a, a similarly negative example is if, if you've been humiliated, if you've been badly humiliated, it might be very difficult for you to say, I am feeling humiliated. I mean, in a way, if you can say, I'm feeling humiliated, it can't have been all that bad. If, if you see what I mean, if someone says, well, I feel quite humiliated, that's really a sign that they're on the fight back. If they really have been badly humiliated, the last thing they're going to do is say, I am feeling humiliated. That just adds more humiliation to the thing. You see what I mean? Um, or if you take someone who's, this is, um, I think it's an 18th century picture of someone um, uh, in the throes of jealousy. Um, you say to yourself, am I feeling jealous? No, no, it's absurd to say I'm feeling jealous about what Sally does. Sally could do what she likes. I just do not care. And there you sit in your study, surrounded by your demons, saying, jealous? I'm not jealous. Later that same night, there you are, sitting in a parked car outside an apartment block, saying, jealous? I'm not jealous. I don't care what she does. Um, it can be, I mean, this is not autobiographical, I hasten to say. <laughs> Um, it can be hard to admit, it can be hard to know of your own jealousy. It's not as if jealousy is something that, um, well, you just take a quick glance inside the circle of the mind and you say, oh, there it is, my old friend jealousy. Or, you know, it's not there. You don't have, in general, that kind of authoritative knowledge as to whether you're jealous or not, as, or as whether you're ashamed of your background or not. And at the same time, these kinds of self-knowledge 
seem to be the ones that are most important. It really seems valuable to have that kind of knowledge of yourself. And here's uh, Benjamin Franklin on this topic. Franklin said, there are three things extremely hard. Steal a diamond and to know oneself. God bless him. Um, <laughs> now, this comes, I think this connects to a topic that um, came up in discussion last time. Someone was comparing knowledge of yourself as a physical object to knowledge of your own mental states. Um, so um, it's one thing to have Descartes' kind of knowledge that you could have, whether or not it was all a dream, whether or not you were having hallucinations. Um, that kind of knowledge of what kind of sensations I'm having in there, uh, with the knowledge of yourself as a physical object that you have of how much you weigh, what height you are, whether you're male or female, that kind of thing. There are lots of um, basic kinds of knowledge of yourself as a physical object uh, that, well, in Descartes' picture, you start out with your own inner life. You start out with your knowledge of your sensations. That's like the beginning of knowledge. And then you say, but, but is all this a dream? Or are all these people really there? Are all these chairs and so on really there? and then you work out to the chairs and so on. But when you think of how, in fact, you have knowledge of yourself as a physical object, it doesn't really seem to depend on knowledge of your own mental states. I mean, knowing uh, where you are, if you look right now, where are you? <laughs> in a classroom. Are there people around you? Are you in the middle of a bunch of people? I promise you, you are. Uh, but vision tells you that stuff. Vision tells you what's going on around you, but it also tells you where you are with respect to all that stuff, and it tells you about how you're moving. Um, there are experiments they do with uh, toddlers who just barely learned to walk, um, where they put these unfortunate children in um, a moving room. So a moving room has uh, four walls, but uh, three sides of it are false. Three sides of it are mounted on rollers. So um, you can put the child in the middle of the false room. And so you get this little kid that's um, barely able to stand, um, put them surrounded by these walls, and then you pull the walls away from them or pull the walls towards them. Um, uh, the child is using vision to figure out um, whether it's moving forwards or moving backwards. When the walls move, it, its vision is telling it, you're moving forwards. So it leans back a bit to compensate, and it goes over like a skittle. Um, I, I, <laughs> it's, it's hard to believe that people are paid to do this kind of work, but I, I once saw a sequence of about 50 of these shots of children, just the, the walls move, and the <laughs> <laughs> Extremely satisfying. Um, <laughs> um, but that makes it very clear. It's harder to do it with adults. Adults have learned tricks. But um, you use vision all the time to figure out how you're moving. Um, uh, so you get knowledge of yourself mm -hmm. as a physical object. Um, another way is intelligent use of mirrors. Um, here is... Um, uh, uh, an elephant with um, an X marked on it in chalk. Um, you put the elephant in front of the mirror. This was only done a few years ago. Uh, you put the elephant in front of the mirror where it can see the chalk. And God bless it, can you guess what the elephant does? With its trunk. <laughs> it touches the X with its trunk. OK, so if you can do that, you've got some knowledge of yourself as a physical object. That doesn't show, there, there was some other example last time of intelligent use of mirrors that I, I can't remember. Can you remember? Yeah, it was um, It was, it was, um, they did like two tests of dogs and you could see, sorry, you could see one, um, yeah. one was visible through a mirror. Um, well, you could see one directly and one was visible through a mirror. You couldn't see it through a mirror, but you could see an image through one as well. Uh -huh. Look in the mirror, and you can see one of the blobs in the mirror, but you can't see the other. Exactly, just the one you can't see, the other you can't see. I see. So they, they try and pinpoint um, when they look in the mirror, are they going to try and physically test on themselves the one they see in the mirror, or are they going to try and physically test the 
one that they offered. I see. Okay. So what does that tell you? It tells you that they're thinking of themselves as themselves in the mirror. I see. So, okay. So they're getting it, that's me in the mirror. So it's the same bottom line as here. Yeah. Okay, so there is that intelligent use of mirrors. Now, the thing is, that seems like kind of a special case, because after all, we don't all have mirrors, we don't all have access to mirrors. Um, it doesn't really seem essential for your knowledge of yourself. I mean, nobody said to Descartes, you, <laughs> if only you had a mirror, you could have sorted all this out much earlier. Um, but there is something much more basic going on, which is social mirroring. There's, um, or in ordinary life, we all the time use other people to mirror, to understand how we are ourselves. Um, the, here is um, the psychologist Andy Meltzoff, who has spent, I don't know, maybe 40 years or so looking at this phenomenon. This is Meltzoff in the early days, um, uh, sticking his tongue out at um, uh, a very young baby. And uh, so Meltzoff sticks his tongue out at the baby and a couple of uh, uh, seconds later, the baby sticks its tongue out. So um, uh, you, you stick your tongue to the left, you stick your tongue to the right, the baby sticks its tongue to the left, the baby sticks its tongue to the right. You do it with mouth opening, ooh. Um, you do it with that kind of pursing of the mouth, and the baby will imitate. This happens very, very young. For, um, it's been extensively tested with babies as young as two or three days old. Um, the earliest tested the baby was 40 minutes old. Um, I don't know if you can guess whose baby it was. Um, <laughs> that was Meltzov's intro Junior's introduction to the world. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, children do this very, very young. And um, it takes a little while longer, but children as young as 14 months will recognize that they are being imitated. If when the child makes a move, you make a move, when the child, uh, then children will recognize that that's what's going on. Yeah? That, that's really basic to ordinary social life. You have to get it, how other people's movements and behavior are synchronized with yours. And this becomes part of understanding of the mind once you get it that, after all, it doesn't really matter about tongue sticking out in itself. What really matters is that you recognize if you smile, does the other person smile? If you look serious, does the other person look serious? How are your emotional expressions connected up to the other person's? So our way of getting on to the mind in this kind of, in this kind of context is basically social. It's nothing to do with sitting in an armchair looking inside the circle of your head and seeing what is going on in there. It is getting synchronized with other people and understanding how you do in relation to them. Do you have a good sense of humor? How can you tell? Can you tell that by just looking inside your mind and saying, ah, there it is, a sense of humor, a good, big, strong one? Yeah? yeah? No, you can tell because, like, uh, somebody tells a joke and they laugh, and then, like, you can't tell if they have a good sense of humor. That's right. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you want to try being a lecturer? Um, <laughs> you tell a joke, everybody says, what did he say? Um, and a kind of ripple goes around the room and you can see that people are trying to write it down. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's that kind of thing, right? You, 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 you only know, uh, I mean, a sense of humor is a psychological characteristic that people have or not. But you can't tell whether you have one just by looking inside the circle of your mind. You have to be engaged in social interactions to find that out about yourself. So in general, couldn't that be the way you find out about your mind? Isn't that, in fact, the way you find out about your mind? It's not by saying, well, maybe it's all a dream and all these people don't exist, but I know what's going on in here, all right. Rather, you know about your own psychological characteristics because you understand how other people are responding to you psychologically, and particularly for things like character traits or aspects of personality that matter socially. I mean, for things like, am I an extrovert or an introvert? Well, <laughs> if you think it might all well, it might as well all be a dream. I can tell you what the answer is. I mean, 
um, things like whether you're extroverted or introverted can't actually be found just by looking reflectively inside your mind. You have to know what's going on in your social engagements. Now, when you think of it like that, your knowledge of your own mind depends on your knowledge of other people's minds. Your knowledge of other people's minds could be just as basic as knowledge of your own mind. So in this kind of picture, Descartes' kind of picture, where you just look inside your own circle and you see what's there, and it's a struggle to get out to the physical world. Um, on this kind of picture, what's going on inside someone else's circle is not something that you necessarily have any knowledge of at all. Other people might not, not have any knowledge of what's going on inside you. But this kind of social picture uh, um, suggests a quite different take on things, that you only know what's going on inside your own mind because you know what's going on with other people's minds. Fair enough? Yep. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, your, your mind is shaped by the context you're in, by the social context you're in, that's what you're saying. Yeah, and one of the interesting and elusive things about self-knowledge is that it doesn't leave the mind unchanged. I mean, take this case, take, um, what's it going, oh, sorry. Take um, Taylor's case of know knowing that you're ashamed of your background once you know that that's what's happening with you, once you know that you're embarrassed about where you came from, the cultural context, that actually changes what's happening in your mind. If you are interacting with other people and finding out about how you are from the interactions with other people, that is going to change your mind. That is going to make a difference to how you are. Um, so one of the... Um, things that about, about knowledge of your own mind that is always intriguing is that, I mean, it never goes away, this puzzle, that on the one hand, you're trying to find out about a bit of reality. Your own mind is a bit of reality. But when you find out about it, you're trying to just track how things are with that bit of reality. But you're finding out about it, whether it's through social interaction, this, or this kind of verbalization, um, that changes what's going on in the mind. Is that getting at the question? Yeah. Is, yeah. Yep. There could be. I'm sorry. Uh, there could be a deceiver. Yes. No, I'm saying if you assume a deceiver, I, I would put it around the other way. If you assume a deceiver, then um, you would actually lose knowledge of your own mind. So much of your knowledge of your own mind comes from social interaction. If you assume that this is all a, a, all a dream, this is all just hallucinations, then you have no way of knowing how you are in social interactions. I mean, l let me take for example, suppose I'm wondering Am I brave? Do I have a lot of physical courage? Yeah, I'm really not sure. I, I, I've never really been put to the test. Yeah, um, uh, but if I assume I'm having a dream in which I display great physical courage, right, every night I have dreams of the death-defying feats I, um, I carry out, does that show that I'm physically brave? It does not show that I'm, <laughs> more is the pity, right? If I spend the whole day daydreaming about um, my um, military activities or whatever it is, then I'm um, saving um, people from burning buildings and so on, then uh, uh, that doesn't at all show that I'm brave. If I'm really a brain in a vat, or if I'm really being deceived by a, by a great deceiver, then I have no idea whether I'm brave or not. Yeah? So that would, assuming a deceiver would take away knowledge of my own psychological characteristics. Yeah. 
Am I generous? You know, similarly, am I generous and kind-hearted? Dreaming about doing a whole bunch of generous and kind-hearted things is not at all the same thing as actually being generous or kind-hearted. Yeah? Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, that, well, that, that's what I'm opposing to Descartes. I wish it was my own original idea, but um, frankly, it's not. <laughs> um, I mean, there's a great deal of work in um, social or developmental psychology about, uh, I, I mean, Meltzoff's work there really is uh, the tip of an iceberg of a lot of stuff about how uh, that capacity to understand other people as mirroring your own um, mental states. Uh, 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 illuminates your knowledge of your own mind. Yeah. So I'm challenging Descartes with his picture. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, it need not be as crude as that. It might not be. Uh, uh, well, I'm sorry. I don't, <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't mean to be. <laughs> Abusive. <laughs> um, what I mean is, it need not be a. You, it's certainly asking the other people around you is one thing to do, but um, uh, of course you've got. If you're asking, am I popular? Yeah. Um, well, you can ask your friends, am I popular? But if, unless your friends are a pretty tough lot, you know what they're going to say. They're all going to say yes, yes, sure, um, yeah. But uh, th that's not to say that you can find out whether you're popular by just looking inside your own mind. Yeah. It's that. You find out by reflecting on your interactions with other people, but it's less direct than just asking them. Exa exactly, observing them. Doing a count at your birth... I'm sorry, I don't want to depress anybody. <laughs> Doing a count at your birthday party, for example. Yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, there are all kinds of... You know, a million indirect ways of finding out, but they all involve the actual other people. You couldn't do it if it was all a dream. D does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, yes, sure. You can misread other people. Uh, I, I strongly agree. You, you, you really can misread other people. That's right. One analysis, well, there are two different things here. Can't you misread other people? Can't you think you understand other people psychologically and be getting it wrong? That, I think that's just correct. Um, and uh, if you habitually get it wrong in that way, I think you're also likely to be getting it wrong about your own mental states. Um, the case of Asperger's is quite, um, well, it's complicated what is going on in Asperger's, but one analysis of what's going on is that an element in the disorder is that um, the, the subject doesn't uh, have very good understanding of other people's mental states at all, that they may not even have the idea of other people as having mental states. But correlatively with that, people with Asperger's all, typically also have trouble with their own mental states. Yeah, that kind of deep analysis of their own mental states, um, of whether you're ashamed of your background, is something that's going to be very, it's going to be impossible, really, for an Asperger's patient. Yeah? Sorry, can you say that again? That's right, that's what I, that, that is exactly what I'm suggesting, that you wouldn't know yourself if you misread other people the whole time. Exactly, that's right. Um, yeah, they have to exist for you to get it right. I mean, <laughs> you, only, you only have any chance of getting uh, your knowledge of yourself onto the tracks if you can get it right about the other people. Yeah. Uh, yes? Yes, sorry. Is it? I, thought, I thought you had your hand up. Yeah. That's what Descartes says, okay? So I'm not, here I'm not trying to um, just refute Descartes and wave goodbye. I'm trying to suggest that here is another picture 
of how you have knowledge of yourself, not by just looking inside your own mind, but by using other people as a mirror. Yeah? So just as you can have knowledge of yourself physically by using a regular mirror, you use other people to mirror how you are. Yeah? Um, and I think, I, I, I think that's just recognizable in everyday life. That is how you find out about your own psycho many of your own psychological characteristics. Yeah. Am I dependable in a crisis? You know, unless you have some knowledge of what's going on with other people, you can't find out about that kind of characteristic of your own. Oh, it'll set your characteristics will be affected by your environment, sure. Uh, okay, one, two, and then we should move on. Yeah. Your Right. Yeah. I, I agree it can go like that, actually. But I mean, if you just take that example, you say, I mean, I, I don't mean you, but one says, I don't like that kind of trashy pop. I can't bear it. Your friend says, yeah, but whenever it's on the radio, you, you, you smile, you tap, you hum along. Um, you choose it. You have it in, you have it in your iPod. Um, uh, your friend might be able to tell better than you that wh what music you like. Yeah? You say, I can't bear that trash. They say, no, you, you actually like that trash, fine. They might be right and you might be wrong. Yeah, I don't mean you, if you see what I mean <laughs> when I say you. <laughs> but, okay, yeah. Right, that, that, that's an analogy, right? Uh, but I think that's quite a good analogy, yeah. Uh, that um, uh, your mind might be your own work, but other people might be able to see it better than you can yourself, yeah. So that runs completely against Descartes' picture. Uh, so j j just think a minute about um, uh, how it goes for knowledge of your own emotions. I mean, knowledge of your own fear or happiness or depression um, would you, is Descartes picture right there? You just look inside your mind and you can tell whether you're afraid or happy or depressed. Um, and it seems to me that I can say something like, um, Bill, I'm not afraid of Bill. Bill, <laughs> Bill, don't make me laugh. I'm not afraid of Bill. Bill, <clears throat> I'm not afraid of Bill. Um, and you can point out that when Bill is in the room, I tremble, I shake, I can hardly wait to get out. Um, I mean, that can happen. <laughs> I mean, this is not autobiographical, you understand. Um, or I remember someone in a novel saying, um, we were happy then, but we didn't know that we were. And it seems to me that makes perfect sense. I mean, when you're happy, you don't <laughs> typically go along all day thinking, well, by God, there it is again. You know, you look inside and there it is, that blob of happiness. Um, you, you can just be living in a fulfilled way and be perfectly happy and not realize that you are until it all comes to a stop. Um, or I remember someone in Bulgaria talking about life under the Soviets, and she said, um, we were depressed then, but we didn't know that we were. Now that we're not under the Soviets, we're depressed, but the great thing is that we know we're depressed. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's not a, 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 a merry tale, but it seems to me that's perfectly comprehensible. Um, or actually, a friend of mine was, um, uh, had been going through a rough period for about 10 years and uh, was finally diagnosed with clinical depression. And it had never occurred to him or to me that he was depressed. Um, but the minute we got the diagnosis, it immediately made sense. 
I mean, it seems to me that can just happen. You, you can't tell just by looking inside your mind, are you depressed or not. Um, you need assistance to find that out. You need diagnosis to find that out. Um, you might say, well, that's all very well for emotions, but um, what about sensations like pains or itches or whatever? Surely I can tell just by looking inside my mind. I mean, it seems a lot more powerful there, but there are cases, you know, there are these footballers who are engaged in a, a big game who break an arm and carry on. And, um, or guys in a battlefield um, who have a limb blown off and just carry on. And it's only later that they attend to the injury and say, by God, this is agonizing. I can't, I, I don't understand how I did all that. Yeah? In that super well, well, what I'm saying, with these cases, you're talking about people who have a lot of pain but don't show it, but they know they're in pain. Yeah, My kind of case is like, suppose you have a real bad headache um, and then you start watching TV and something comes on that grabs your attention and you forget all about your headache. Yeah, You're not thinking, hey, I've got a headache the whole time. Um, but the minute the thing you're watching f stops, the headache's there. Now, presumably it was there the whole time, um, but you didn't notice. And presumably something like that is what's happening with the footballers or the soldiers on the battlefield. Um, it was there the whole time, but they didn't notice. So what I'm describing is something like a super Spartan where nobody else notices that they have the pain, but they don't even notice themselves. Couldn't that happen? I mean, there's no reason your own mind should be completely um, open to you. Yeah? Yeah? Well, there's adrenaline going through you, but the question is, is that the pain's still there, but you're just not noticing it because of the adrenaline? Yeah? Yes. Sure, no question that the physical stuff affects the mental state. But the question is, doesn't the adrenaline just affect the direction of your attention? You, you see what I mean? So the pain's sitting there the whole time. Your attention is just deflected away from it by this adrenaline rush. Yeah. Um, I mean, there, there are lots of cases. Uh, I mean, the, 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 uh, take the belief that so someone once said about a friend of mine, um, she doesn't think that you can trust doctors. If you ask my friend directly, she says, of course he I think you can trust doctors. But actually, you look at what she does. She doesn't believe in doctors for a second. You know, she, she will go to the doctor as a last resort. Um, she won't believe what the doctor says. Half the time, she will not take the medication um, and wants a second opinion. The, uh, she just does not trust doctors. Someone else can know what you believe about doctors better than you do yourself. Yep. I have a question about the adrenaline. Yes, Raha. That's right, the adrenaline distracts you, that's what I'm suggesting, yeah. But if you, you can't, like, if, are you saying that if you never, if you always have your mind distracted, could you never feel pain? Like, no, right? Uh-huh. Really? Well, you wouldn't know, you could feel, it. well, you could be in the pain, but you wouldn't know you were. If you spent your life on a big football game, who knows how often, how many arms you could have broken? Um, and just carry on playing, so long as you were really focused on the game. I'm not suggesting you. I'm not suggesting you try this at home or something. Yeah. So once it like stops you from doing something else, then you're acknowledging it and you can feel it. Once you're reflecting on it and attending to it, yeah, yeah, that's different. Then you know you have the sensation. Uh, wow. Okay. Let's go quickly. You haven't asked the question yet. When, yeah.
Yes. Yes. Right. It's like once I notice that I cut myself is when I start doing the same thing. I think that's kind of what you. Yeah. Well, exactly. That's exactly the situation. That's uh, that's. Uh, that's great, actually, because my, my examples are a little bit exotic. I mean, not the football's all that exotic, but it's a little bit exotic. Yeah, but yeah, what was it? Yeah, absolutely, it can happen then. Yeah, the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Why do the children still get the gospel distractions? Why are children so susceptible to distractions? I'm not sure they are. It depends what you mean, children. I mean, there's one hypothesis, uh, I'm not sure if it's true, that um, young children, very young children, can't actually control the direction of their attention at all. So that if something unpleasant, if they've locked on to something unpleasant, they can't tear themselves away. You know, so they will keep focusing on the thing that is making them cry. Uh, and the, 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 what, what a caregiver will do then is try and yank them away, from, you know, maybe physically yank them away from that thing. You, you see what I mean? But that the child itself does not have that kind of control of attention. Um, the, I think uh, the, 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 this is open to um, empirical argument, um, but that's, that's one view that's been put forward by Ruff and Rothbart. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, okay. Um, one, okay, you, you, didn't, you didn't have a question yet, yeah. yeah. Non-permanent. I mean, yeah. Like that, for example, they're not permanent things. That's right. Yeah. The the so f the things you've done so far are not permanent. Yeah. So actually, aren't they the kind of the status of the self? Like, so they are. They're like they might be part, but they are not the core of. They're not the core of the self. Well. Um, Suppose you go, you go to one of the bottom things in the list there. Um, I have a friend who was um, in one of these late night um, uh, uh, discussions was telling me the other day that he, um, he's crippled by shyness. It really um, spoils his professional life. Um, this is a guy who a couple of months ago, I saw at a conference being asked to take a microphone unexpectedly and who practically fainted with pleasure. I mean, he, he, he was visibly glowing as he took the mic and stood in front of um, the, the, the people at the meeting. Now, um, um, I think he was perfectly sincere when he was set, telling me how his life was crippled by shyness, but I just don't believe it for a second. What a lot of hooey. Um, this, <laughs> this is a guy who loves being the center of social attention, who I would put it even more strongly, his life is for being the center of social attention. Yeah, so I think that's an abiding characteristic of people. You know, that's something that, that can last with you for many years. Um, I think you're not authoritative about that either. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's right, but uh, what you're saying makes perfect sense, but reacting to things would include, yes. That's exactly right. The, I think that's right, but uh, the, 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 the remember, bear in mind that when you say the patterns that you, that you learn by seeing what you're reacting to, the things that you're reacting to, they will centrally include other people and their psychological states. Um, not just you know, blades of grass or something. The important thing for your knowledge of your own mind will be your knowledge of how you interact with other people. <laughs> I, I, I don't mean to shut off this. The, I, I want to put the anti-Descartes case as strongly as I can here, but it's not at all what I want to just close off Descartes. It's in a, they're both important positions, it seems to me. We should really move on. Is there, uh, there were a number of other questions. Is, 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 anyone, anyone has something quick, I guess? A quick comment? A biting remark? OK. Yes, yes, good. Yeah, well, if you 
If you're born without the ability to feel pain, then you're in a lot of trouble. Uh, actually, you know, you're not going to know what's safe or not. But no, I don't think you can feel invincible for very long. I mean, once you've broken an arm or something, <laughs> it's not just pain. Did you see what I mean? There's too much stuff you can't do. Um, so uh, I, I think it really is a handicap that. Uh, not having a sense, uh, an ability to feel pain. But look, the key thing I want to get onto here is, this is, if you think about how you know about your own mind, and now think you, about how you know about someone else's mind, don't you know about your own mind in exactly the same way that you know about someone else's mind? When you think about how you know about someone else's emotions and sensations and thoughts and beliefs and virtues and so on, then it's, you just do exactly the same thing with them as you do with yourself. If you're thinking about whether someone else is a friend of yours ashamed of their background, you find out about that in exactly the same way you find out about whether you are ashamed of your background. If you're going to find out about whether you really trust doctors, you find out about that in exactly the same way that you find out about whether someone else is a, is a, is trusts doctors. Um, all these things, you find out about whether you are shy in the same way that you find out whether someone else is shy. You basically observe yourself or you observe the other in social situations. The way you have knowledge of yourself is not fundamentally different to the way you have knowledge of other people. I mean, it seems different because um, you seem so fast and easy in your own case and relatively difficult in the case of other people. But I don't know, suppose you think about um, uh, people who are interested in politics um, are usually particularly interested in the politics of some one country or maybe a couple of countries. So they may have a good general knowledge of political systems, but usually they will focus on present day Russia or France in the 19th century. They will focus on some particular um, uh, state and get a good knowledge of that state's political functioning. So you can be an expert on one country. Um, and similarly with people, you can have a good understanding of how human psychology works, but most of us specialize, right? We specialize in the mental lives of our friends or the mental lives of our family. And you can really be finely tuned to uh, someone else. It can be that when you're sitting having breakfast and someone else comes down the stairs, you can tell how they are feeling just from the way the stairs creak. You just sit there and you think, oh my God, now, <laughs> now I know what kind of morning I'm going to have just as you listen to the creaking of the stairs. This is not autobiographical, I, <laughs> I take it that's recognizable, right? The when you know someone well, the slightest thing can tip you off to what's going on with them. But now, Think about yourself. You might have known a member of your family for 20 years, but you know yourself much more intimately than that. There have been no gaps in your observation of yourself. The great thing about yourself is you're always around, right? So you always know exactly what's going on with yourself, what you're doing. So you are an expert on your own mental states. So you know about your own mental states in just the same way that you know about the mental states of other people, but you are just much faster and slicker at it. The slightest thing tips you off as to what your mental states are. Um, yeah. Okay, so, yep. Yeah. Yeah, people, yeah people, that can happen, I agree. Yeah. People can mask their own mental states. But, but doesn't that uh, you know, build into the statement that you know about your own mental states? I mean, like, yeah. sometimes there's situations where you can't reach somebody. I mean, like, I, like a good example would be in a poker tournament. You know, like, there are planes, but not, you know, like, cocktails. And, you know, people are, you know, yeah, yeah, like, you know
I do. I, 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 I completely agree. That can happen. You have a poker face, as we say. Yeah, yeah. Um, you hide what you're thinking from the other people. You hide your reactions from the other people. We can do that. Um, but the thing is that what you're hiding then is you have some cues available to you that the other people don't have available to them. But they could have them available to them. I mean, you, 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 you're just hiding some cues but not others. And they're not getting the cues that you didn't manage to hide. Um, I would also say one of the things about life that I find terrifying personally is um, you th think about how sensitive and perceptive you can be about the mental states of other people, right? You just, you're sitting in a group and a lightning expression crosses someone's face. Their eyes just turn for a moment. And you say, my God, I can't believe it. He's jealous. Yeah, you can catch in a flash what's going on with someone else's mental life. Um, and when you think about how perceptive you are about other people's mental lives, just think other people are that perceptive about you. Um, and that is a, well, <laughs> I find that an unnerving thought, right? That um, other people can be doing to me what I do so easily to other people. Um, and I think the truth is that although we can mask from other people, we're at least as good at masking from ourselves um, as we are at masking from other people. Uh, well, well, one more. And, yeah, and, Yeah. I agree. It's never 100 percent. Yeah. Ah, well, th that's the thing. I don't believe the last thing. You in your own mind, you would know if you were jealous. Maybe in that case, they would be sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Yeah, that is just. Never for sure. never that's right. I, I agree with that in both cases. Um, yep. Yes. Yes. The, 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 that's exactly the interpretation. I don't know if you guys have come across this mirror neurons. Um, the idea is that um, there are neurons in my head that um, uh, when I see someone else smile, they are also the same neurons that are implicated in my smiling. Yeah. So that's why it's so easy to imitate people is the idea. I mean, it's amazing how easy it is to imitate someone else. Um, um, and uh, these m neurons are supposed to be firing in the same way. The same neurons are supposed to be firing for your observation of other people performing an action as are for your own performance of that action. That's the idea. So that, that, that's a, a speculation about the kind of physiology that's underlying this kind of social ability. Yeah, so I, I agree that's absolutely dead on point. Yeah. Um, okay. That's the idea, yeah, yeah. The, uh, that's, well, all that is extremely speculative, but, um, but that is the speculation. <laughs> I agree, yeah. Okay, so here's Ryle. Um, this is Ryle on Descartes' view of what's going on when you look inside your own mind. This is what Ryle calls the classical, is it called a classical view? I can't. The, uh, the received view, the official view? The official view, thank you. <laughs> right. Not only can you view and scrutinize a flower through your sense of sight and listen to and discriminate the notes of a bell through your sense of hearing. So this is Ryle stating the kind of picture of the mind that he opposes and that I've been opposing. You can also reflectively or introspectively watch without any bodily organ of sense the current episodes of your inner life. This self-observation, looking inside the circle, is commonly supposed to be immune from illusion or confusion or doubt, unlike your perception of other people or the world around you. That's what Ryle's calling the official view of how your knowledge of your own mind is different to your knowledge of other people's mind. On the other side, the person has no direct access of any sort to the events of the inner life of another. Absolute solitude is on Descartes' picture, the ineluctable destiny of the soul. Only our bodies can meet. A poignant thought. Um, okay. Can you put your hand up 
if you think that your knowledge of your own mental life is quite different to your knowledge of someone else's mental life. Can you put your hand up if I persuaded you that your knowledge of someone else's mental life is not like your knowledge of, um, is like your, sorry, that your knowledge of someone else's mental life is the same kind of thing as your knowledge of your own mental life? One, two, three, four, five, <laughs> six, seven. Okay, let me carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Undaunted. Does, does anyone, so you guys are by a majority accepting the official view. Yes, Descartes' view. That's clear? Yeah, I mean, Descartes saying you look inside your own mind, that's quite different to when you try and get onto someone else's mind. I've been trying to argue that your access to your own mind is just like your access to someone else's mind. Is that clear what's going on here? Yeah. Yeah. Anyone want to, exp yeah, what, yeah? I think to do with like, uh, your relationship to the person though. Like if you're closer with oh, someone, yeah. you'll be able to like, know more about them. That's what I'm suggesting is if you're very close to another person, people talk about, well, you're tele telepathic. Yeah, you know, I yeah. So right. I, like, am very, like, I know exactly what she's thinking all the time. Like, very good. Moment, yeah. And, but I don't feel that way with a lot of other people. Like, sure. But I guess I just prefer not being around other people. Exactly. So, um, um, yeah. So you, just as you are with your twin, everybody is with themselves. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think it's in part just it's like there's a lot of reasons why you know what you think about um, like yes. in general, but it's hard to know if you're seeing the same thing that you're doing with someone. Is there like this reason that you're seeing that? Like, can it be the same thing? I don't know. There's so much that you can't really unpack. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, we're going to come on to it. We're going to spend quite a lot of time on that example, actually, in, in just a couple of weeks. Okay, let, let me postpone discussing that too much right now. Okay. Um, let, me try, let me carry on hammering away and trying to persuade you that um, the way your own, not knowing how your own mind is working is pretty much like knowing how other people's mind works. I mean, suppose um, you think about mental arithmetic. Sometimes when you've got a sum to do, like a, 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 you, you can do it in your head, right? What's eight and 11? Eight and 11 class. Very good, you just did that in your head just like that, right? Okay, but sometimes um, you uh, can get a sum that is uh, just too hard to do in your head, so you have to do it on paper. Um, I mean, let, let me try doing a long division. Um, can someone give me a big number? <laughs> 453,000. Is that it? Uh, yes, and 63. And 63. <laughs> right. Yep. Wait a minute. Oh, yes, right. I know how to write numbers. <laughs> okay. And could I have a number to divide into it? I got to add three more. Oh, God, I had three more zeros. Boy, OK, you guys are hard. <laughs> OK. So can I have a number to divide into it? 6.2. So, 6 no <laughs> decimals. <laughs> 62. OK, what about 62? OK. So look, OK. Um, um, <laughs> is that right? <laughs> is that right? Yes? Sorry, it's a vertical line. Okay. Oh, not this. <laughs> oh, keep the top line. Okay. <laughs> For the purposes of the demonstration, I'm a better example than you are. <laughs> I mean. That's really impressive, <laughs> but, and I wish I could do it. But look, let's, let's see. Let, 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 let me try and, uh, since I can't do that, right? The whole point is I can't do that in my head. So um, how am I going to do it on paper? So it's 62 into 45. <laughs> um, so that doesn't go, right? So it's 62 into 453. Uh, okay, so that's is that four, five, um, five, six, uh, six, seven, seven. Yeah, okay, let's try six, uh, seven. Seven twos are um, 14, and another one is uh, 
13. No, no, wait a minute. Uh, 43. I, I knew it was 43. Right. Um, and yeah, right. And then I subtract, and that goes 4 from 3 is 9, and uh, 4 from 5 is 1, and then there's a 0. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So it's 62 into 190, which is uh, 3. 3? Three? Three. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, I'm not sure I have the mental. <laughs> I'm not sure I have the mental um, endurance to carry on much longer. But let, let, let me just do this. So, so that's 186, right? And then there's a four, and then there's a zero. Uh oh. Is that right? That can't be right. Is that all right? So I put a zero. To, oh, I see. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And then there's another zero. Okay. And so the long day wails on. Okay, um, we, <laughs> we could leave the rest of that as homework. Um, but, <laughs> um, but look, the thing is, um, suppose you think of thinking as manipulating with symbols, right? You did that in your head, yeah? So, um, uh, you can work with the symbols in your head, and then you say, that's what Rodin's thinker was doing, right? They were working with the symbols in their head. But what I was doing right there, I was working with the symbols out loud. Um, I promise you, it's not, I, I, I wish I could say that I have got that far in my head, and then I just wrote it all out on paper. But I couldn't have got that far without writing it out on paper. I was working with the symbols in public. The act of thinking, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I sympathize if you say you wouldn't call that thinking, but it is, in its humble way, it is a kind of thinking, right? So the, the act of thinking there was taking place on the board. All the manipulation of symbols was taking place on the board. You could see the thinking going on just as well as I could. It wasn't as if, if I cast my inner gaze into my head, well, what I'd get if I cast my inner gaze into my head is damn all, you know, except a, a series of cries of dismay or something. Um, if I want to see the thinking, I've got to look at the board the same way you do. And actually, for a lot, th th this is not really a special case, for lots of ordinary life, if you're having a conversation with someone, well, if you're having a conversation with someone, it can happen that you've got an agenda. This is really going to be a controlled conversation. And before you speak, before you say anything, you think through just which words you're going to use and how you're going to target that. But that is not the usual case. As we talk right now, as you guys raise challenges or objections or whatever, I promise you that what I say back, <laughs> what you hear is all there is. All the thinking that's going on is going on out loud. It's not as if typically there's a whole bunch of calculation going on backstage and then you're just seeing the outer reflection. What's going on in the mind is just as visible to you as it is to me. Um, and ordinary social life, ordinary conversation is all like that. Um, you observe the other person's thinking just by hearing them talk. Um, so I think it's true that um, just as one student did there, you can do that same calculation in your head. And if you just clutch your head and do the calculation, maybe no one else can tell what you're thinking. But when you do it out loud, other people can observe the thinking just as well as you can yourself. And all the mental activity is being carried out in public. And when you think about it, um, um, that's the way it goes for lots of mental states. Suppose you're really angry with someone. Well, it, 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 if you're well-bred and controlled, it can happen that the other person couldn't tell Nobody could tell. There were just the merest quiver of your nostrils that might give it away that you um, were furiously angry with this person. But it can also happen that you do it out loud. It can also happen that you bang the table, that you shout, that you yell, that you grasp the um Anyway, um, <laughs> that, uh, that, that you do the whole thing. And when you do that, 
it's like thinking out loud. There may be nothing of the anger backstage. It's not as if the true anger is backstage and what's going on out loud is just some mere external accompaniment any more than what's going on there is um, that the true calculation is going on in my head and the stuff in the board is just some mere external accompaniment. Um, that's so for lots of cases. If you think about trying to find your watch, suppose you lost your watch and you're trying to find it, then um, one way you can do that is just by sitting there clutching your head and thinking, well, where did I see it last? But the other way you can do it is by looking under the table, looking in the fridge, um, looking um, on the shelf. Uh, you could hunt. Other people can see what you're doing just as well as you can in that case, even though you can also do it quietly. Um, um, Ryle uh, puts it like this. The fundamental classifications of the mind are ways of classifying behaviors. It's not as if um, uh, there's always something inner that is the real mental state, as if when I was doing the calculation in the board, there's always something in the head that's a real mental state or the real anger, and that's what psychology is concerned with. Really, what we're concerned with in psychology is the classification of behavior. What mental terms are doing is classifying behavior. People talk about, um, well, the mind is something underlying the behavior, and Ryle has this example. He says, looking for where the mind is is just a category mistake. He says, people hunt for the mind and they say, is it in the brain? Is it in ectoplasm? Is it in something else? And he's got this example of some, showing someone the university. Suppose someone visits Berkeley and um, you are keen to show off the splendors of the campus. You show them Wheeler Hall. You say, this is where the police routinely tear gas us. Um, <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is where we like to hang from the win windows. Um, you say, um, look, there is the Campanile. Um, there, there is the merry throng at lunchtime, and so on and so forth. Um, there they all are. So you show your friend all around the campus, and your friend says, that's fantastic. So many spectacular and interesting sights. And then they say, but where? I've heard so much about the famous University of Berkeley. Where is it? I mean, is it the Campanile? No. Is it the merry throng at lunchtime? No. Is the university the same thing as Wheeler Hall? No. He says, so you've shown me all these interesting sites, but where is the university? And you see what he's thinking? He's thinking that when he says, where is the university? That means it's somewhere deep underground, maybe some dungeon below California Hall is the real thing. That's where the University of California, Berkeley, is really located. That's the true thing. And the right answer is, that is just a mistake. The university is not something over and above all these other things. That was the university, all that stuff. There's no more to it than that. And similarly, when people say, well, yeah, I know you can do stuff like write stuff in the board or um, I know you can do stuff like write stuff in the board or talk, um, have conversations about philosophy, um, shriek, stamp your fist, and so on. I know you can do all that, but where is the mind? That is a really puzzling thing. And the answer is there is no more to having a mind than being able to engage in conversation, being able to interact with other people, being able to... Um, um, hunt for your watch when you've lost it. That's all there is to having a mind. And searching for the true essence of the mind, as if it's some ectoplasm in the brain, as if deep in some dungeon in the brain, we are going to find consciousness hiding. That is just a mistake. That is just a daft mistake, actually. Um, there's an example Wittgenstein gives of um, expecting someone to come for tea at 4 o'clock. So you've invited, let us suppose, someone for tea at 4 o'clock. So you're expecting them then. So what happens? What goes on when you're expecting someone for tea? Well, you look at the, you look at the clock as um, the time gets towards 4 I mean, you guys know about tea, right? Tea? 
Okay, okay, just checking. I, I never know. Okay. <laughs> okay. As the time gets towards four o'clock, you start to assemble the tea things. You look anxiously out of the window. Um, you uh, put water in the kettle. You pour the boiling water out of the kettle and into the teapot. That's what goes on when you're expecting someone at four o'clock. Um, there's no more to expectation than that. It's not as if deep in a dungeon in the brain there is some blob of sensation. That's really expecting. That's, that, that's a true expectation right in there in your head. All that's happening is all that stuff that is just perfectly visible behavior. Um, so there is no more to your psychological life than complex behaviors. This is thought to be the kind of thing that Wittgenstein was imagining. Um, there's the old boy there on the right. OK? So that's getting behaviorism stated, that um, um, talking about the mind is just a way of talking about behavior. You don't have any special knowledge of your own mind. You don't have uh, other people, but your own mind isn't particularly inaccessible to other people either. Fair enough? So that's a quite radically different picture to Descartes. No ectoplasm, just the ordinary behaviors, just ways of classifying ordinary behavior. That's fair enough? Can you put your hand up if you think that's right? Wow, good. I think this is a very important view, even if it's wrong. It probably is wrong. <laughs> but, but, but there's something importantly right here, too. Um, according to uh, Ryle, Dualism is a kind of paramechanical hypothesis. That's to say, you've got the mechanics of the way the clockwork of the body works. You can think of the body as like a clockwork machine. And the mind is like a piece of ghostly clockwork. Para paramechanical in the same way we talk about parapsychology. That Descartes had made a mistake about the logic of his problem. Descartes was asking, what makes behavior intelligent? What makes behavior um, the exercise of a mind? And he should have been asking, what kind of complex behaviors would make us say that something had a mind? Instead, he said, well, given that mechanical causation by a brain is working pretty much the same in the case where you have a mind and the case where you don't, um, what must be making the difference between intelligent behavior and behavior that's not intelligent? is that there's some ghostly bit of clockwork making it go, and that's the ectoplasmic thing that really makes intelligent, uh, that behavior intelligent. And psychology is what describes this ghostly clock. Um, and it's supposed that each of us has their own ghostly clock, and you know about that by introspection. So you know how to classify your own behavior because you could look inwards at your own clock, but you can't see someone else's inner clockwork so you never know really what's going on with other people. But Descartes was asking the wrong question there by asking about the causes of behavior. He should have been saying, how do you actually distinguish intelligent from non-intelligent behavior? If you're asking whether dolphins are intelligent, what you're asking is really a question about how do they behave? And you want to know something about what kind of behaviors they exhibit. Um, so psychological terms on this kind of picture are just ways of classifying complex behaviors. They're not ways of identifying the causes of the behavior. We know what causes behavior. It's just bits of your brain. But that's not the same thing as the mind. Having a mind is a matter of how you behave, what the outcome is, how you interact with other people, that kind of thing. So analytical behaviorism is the idea that psychological words Words for what you want or what you like, what you uh, are feeling, what you're, how you're thinking. They are just ways of classifying complex behaviors. That's all that's going on. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. So you see this is radically different to Descartes. Yeah. Everything about the mind is on view. Sometimes you can hide it, but in principle, 
everything can, about your mind can be seen by other people. Yes? Yeah. Right. It doesn't necessarily refute third party view, right? Because the point is that we have to ignore any sensory data because it could be. It could be a, a, a mistake, yes, yes. So because he says that we have to ignore anything that could be potentially wrong, that means that we can't use like a chain of keys. That's right. That's, that's what Descartes has to start the fight back. That on this picture, even if you don't know, if you didn't know about anything about your behaviour or other people's behaviour, you wouldn't know anything about your mind. Yeah, and that's what Descartes is saying. Well, of course I know all about my mind, even if it was all a dream. Yeah. Now I agree that's powerful, but what I've been trying to do is to sabotage that. You know that's what I mean about saying, would you know that you have a good sense of humour? Yeah. I mean, maybe in your dream everybody laughs, but. <laughs> I have dreams like that, right? Um, but um, that doesn't show, that, that doesn't give you knowledge of what your psychological strengths are there. Yeah, so it also seems like why are we just ignoring anything we're hearing? That's right, he's talking, he's talking about how we actually talk about the mind. Like, like yeah. Pragmatic that's right. He's saying that's the only way to think about the mind. I, I agree that the game isn't over. Yeah. Really what I'm trying to do is to state what the game is. If you see what I mean? Yeah, what the issue is here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, words like um, desiring, um, uh, feeling, um, being jealous, um, th th that kind of thing. Yeah. Words that y you can only use them in connection with a mind. Um, so let me try and blast very quickly over a statement of what behaviorism is. Uh, I've taken a long time to try to shape up, because if you don't take a while to shape up what the view is, it may seem just too crazy to take seriously. But I think it is, um, the, it, it is actually the real insights in this way of thinking about the mind. So the idea is you could define psychological concepts in terms of behavior. Um, or Here's Putnam, this is a quote from the Putnam article that we'll be looking at for next time. Uh, Putnam is not an analytical behaviorist. Putnam thinks it's a load of rubbish. Um, so um, uh, this is not Putnam's view. This is him just stating what the view is that he wants to attack. But Putnam says, here's analytical behaviorism that exist entailments between mind statements and behavior statements, entailments that are not analytic. It's, it's not, when you say, being angry is a matter of being inclined to shout, thump the table, and hurt someone, um, then it's not that, well, that happens every single time. It's rather that you only understand what the word anger means when you understand that it's connected to things like uh, shouting and banging the table and so on. Um, so it's not as if you can translate, talk about anger into talk about behavior. But that's only because of superficial reasons, like uh, 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 talking about anger is relatively vague or unspecific compared to talk about exactly how you bang your fist on the table or whether you stamp or whether you shout. A description of behavior is always going to be a bit more specific than talk about the mind. But when you describe someone's mind, what you're really doing is saying what kind of behaviors you can expect. Um, here's Rudolf Carnap, um, the, the great philosopher Carnap, um, who defined um, A, A is excited as follows. Um, Carnap said, to say that A is excited is to assert the existence of that physical structure, especially of his central nervous system, that is characterized by a high pulse and rate of breathing, which on the application of certain stimuli may be made even higher by vehement and factually unsatisfactory answers to questions, by the occurrence of agitated movements on the application of certain stimuli, etc. So that's how you know whether you're excited. Are you giving vehement and factually unsatisfactory answers to questions? In that case, you're excited. Okay, but if Carnap's right, then 
you have no better knowledge of whether you're excited than anybody else does. Just in the last second, can we just take a vote on that? Do you have any better knowledge of whether you're excited than anyone else does? Can you put your hand up if you think you know better than anyone else? Well, I'll tell you whether I'm excited. If that's your view, uh-huh. And if you don't think that? Okay, I would say it's a significant minority, that, but a big minority, I mean a small minority, that say, that say it's the same. Okay, so um, we don't believe analytical behaviorism. Um, onwards, uh, next time is Putnam Brains and Behavior. Thanks, guys.